Good day colleagues from Angola. Um, my name is Tiriwanga uh, Nimutazu. I work with uh, AfroDAT, uh, which is the African Forum and Network on Data and Development, uh, which is a regional organization working on debt issues uh, based in Harare, Zimbabwe. I welcome you to this lecture entitled The Political Economy of African Sovereign Debt, Origins and Consequences. I'm very happy to be part of this OSISA Angola in Ogro Economic Justice School for 2020. Um, I hope you enjoy the, the journey with me uh, as I take you through the lecture. Let me take you to the first slide. I think the first slide, as I said, does try to explain what political economy is. And political economy is a combination of factors that affect decisions about public resource management. So here we are talking of policies, we are talking of institutions, governance, state capacity, civil society, corporate governance. All these factors are very important in any economy. And broadly, there are somehow three major objectives of political economy. And the first one is enforcing commitment to policy towards the economy and sanctioning deviation. I think it's very important that governments do commit to put in place policies that drive economies. And if there are any deviation, then sanctions must be applied. The second objective is political inclusiveness. That is balancing diverse interests in decision making to ensure collective welfare. I think in our societies, it is very important that the absence of political inclusiveness has caused a lot of damage to our nations, conflicts, wars. Hence, it is very important that there be a balance of interests in making decisions so that there is a collective welfare. The third objective is the need to manage resources well and transform it into a sustainable debt. If Africa is a rich continent in natural resources and minerals, they should be managed very well so that we usher it into sustainable development. If debt is a resource as it is, it should be managed very well so that it helps or kickstarts development. I'm, I'm very happy to, quote, to have this quote from the Chilean Minister of Finance way back in 1994, Alexandro Fox Lee, when he said that economists must not only know their economic models, but also understand politics, interests, conflicts, passions, the essence of collective life. For a brief period of time, you, sh you could make changes by decree, but to let them persist, you have to build coalitions and bring people together. You have to be a politician. So it's very difficult to separate politics and the economy. These go hand in hand. They are two sides of the same coin. You have your politics right, you get the economy right. If you have your politics wrong, in most of the cases, the politics, is, I mean, the economy is messed up. My next slide is very important going forward when we discuss debt and even political economy broadly, because in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, as I said, we, the continent is said to be very rich in natural resources, of which it has brought the issue of resource dependency. To what extent to the extent to which a country's economy de depends on resource rents. And this is measured differently as a percentage of GDP, total revenue, percentage of total exports. You will realize that in a resource rich country, there's a linkage between resources and corruption, resources and civil war and also a lack of institutional quality leading to lower growth and economic performance. I think this is very important 
so that it gives us a sense of where we are coming from in terms of the political economy issues that angers the whole debates or discussions on debt. I think the issue of natural resources, the mismanagement of natural resources, the corruption, the fights, has somehow caused our own governments to go outside the boundaries to look for resources in the name of debt, especially external debt. So when the natural resources of our countries are not managed well and they can't trigger development in the countries, then we have a problem of countries going out there to get resources externally, especially debt, so that they, they kickstart their economies. Yes, there's nothing wrong with that. We have seen countries that have developed because of outside help. But in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, I think we have all these challenges that I have spoke about. And it is what then angers the discussions around the political economy issues um, and the need for a very robust discussion going forward of how African countries should manage their economies and politics so that all the other attributes and all the other issues are well grounded uh, in, 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 in normalcy in terms of economic performance. Contrary to common perception, Africa's past indebtedness was not solely attributable to the continent's poor governance, corruption, uh, or conflict, as most would have you believe. I think when you look at literature, when you review the literature around debt uh, in the continent, you, you see some of the reasons of Africa's past indebtedness being mainly attributed to the continent's poor governance. They'll give you an example of Mobutu Sesseko of Zaire then, now DRC Congo, is one of the, 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 the bad cases when it comes to debt management because of poor governance. But yes, there are internal factors that caused that debt over indebtedness but there were also quite a number of other external factors that caused that debt indebtedness in, in the context of Africa. And mainly, the, the, for example, the Cold War geopolitics, the fluctuating commodity prices of which African countries do not have control over, quite a number of them. So it's not only internal factors that caused the indebtedness in the 1990s, but also external factors which were beyond uh, the reach of most of the African countries. How was it addressed? I think a lot of colleagues, a lot of you guys, we've heard about the HIPIC initiative and the MDRI, which were debt relief initiatives, mainly dealing with multilateral debt uh, and the debt from the Paris Club. Paris Club is a credit cartel the grouping of rich countries, especially from the EU, um, which sits as and when a data country requests for a debt rescheduling. So in the past, the, 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 the debts of the past, especially multilateral debt, uh, were solved through the HIPIC initiative and the MDRI. This initiative did help uh, not only African countries, but quite a number of uh, countries globally, 30 of them in Africa, yes, but um, in globally close almost 100 billion worth of debt relief was given to 36 countries globally. And this was really uh, a, a good step. Going forward here, we, we, we are getting into a new wave of debt rising in the continent. And there are phrases that have been thrown around uh, the continent on the rise, especially with regards to economic growth. Uh, the other one is a possible looming debt crisis, meaning that there is a huge increment in terms of the debt levels in a number of African countries. 
So the big question here is, will African countries face another debt crisis as experienced uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s? I think the reason why this question is being thrown around is the, 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 the rate at which the stock of external debt is rising. And when you look in 2010, it was around 293 billion. Uh, and by 2018, it's 644 billion in terms of stock. We have also seen the debt service ratio rising as a, as a percentage of a ratio. I mean, the debt service as a ratio of exports of goods and services rising from 15% in 2010 to almost 28% in 2018. And this is the reason why there is that fear that African countries will face another debt crisis. Uh, I think this is very important. Uh, this figure is just showing um, the, the general government gross debt uh, in terms of sub-Saharan Africa. That from, from 2000, uh, it was very high. Uh, 2005, 2010, it went down. I think it's because of the multilateral debt relief initiative or EPIC that saw almost close to 30 countries in Africa getting uh, their debts reduced. But again, if you, when you look at 2050, it's rising, and 2018, it has actually gone to 644 billion. The most important argument in terms of sovereign day of today is there are so many new, in other words, new dynamics, new debt dynamics. What are the evolution? What is the evolution? How is it evolving? And what are the drivers? What is what 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 are the factors that are pushing? the rise in terms of the debt levels in most of the African countries. Largely, there are both policies and exogenous factors that is driving uh, the new rise in debt in the continent. And primarily, they are what they call budget deficits that are driven uh, mainly by public investments. Um, a lot of countries are investing in infrastructure development uh, and this is really given rise to the need to borrow outside especially external debt the development needs are very high but the resources available domestically are not enough so you see african countries going outside their borders to uh, to borrow so those are some of the reasons why the drivers of the current new debt increases or rises. We have exchange rate depreciation, we have increased interest rates, we have debt and investments. Sometimes you find that not all investment are necessarily growth enhancing. So you 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 see African countries borrowing for consumption instead of production. They borrow for consumption purposes instead of productive purposes. Hence the, the the debt and investment argument you have projects that are poorly managed but they are financed through debt and that's that's a very risky way of managing debts a number of african countries uh, have uh, gone on to borrow what they call uh, non-concessional debt uh, versus concessional debt concessional debt normally is the debts you we get from the imf the world bank or development banks, multilateral development banks. The interest rates are very low, the maturity periods are very long, 20 years, 40 years, compared to non-concessional debt, which is a debt mainly from the private sector, from the commercial sector, it's very risky. So you, the, in terms of percentage, you see that from, from 20, 2010, this, this has been increasing. This has been increasing, and this is mainly the period when a lot of the African countries uh, had their debts cancelled by the multilateral development banks, of which the IMF, the World Bank, and the African Development Bank, and then they went on to borrow on the on the commercial side or private debts. So there's a bit of a shift uh, in terms of the composition of the debt currently in a number of African countries. 
So here you see private creditors, they move towards non, that is, move towards non-conventional debt, increasing large share of African debt held by private banks and uh, bondholders. That's one, 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 one point we see in terms of the shifting of the composition of the debt towards private sector. We've also seen a large now, a large percentage of the debts here um, being Chinese debt. So China has become a substantive creditor and collateralized borrowing is rising uh, very substantially. In 2000, 2002, the amount of Chinese debt was very low, but when you look up to 20, by 2016, it has really increased drastically. So it's very important that the landscape, the composition, and the nature of the creditors has changed. And this is very important in discussions or discourse of, uh, of sovereign debt. So I have a debt risk map here developed uh, by Aphrodite, which shows that the, the, the countries in red are in debt distress already, which means they are having challenges um in, in in a lot of them actually are, are having challenge in servicing their debts close to default i know zimbabwe for example has defaulted on paying its debts it is huge areas to the creditors so all the countries in red you have zimbabwe your zambia your mozambique somalia your sudan south sudan they are in debt challenges those in yellow that's high risk um high risk um, and as, as, as of today, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think a lot of countries are now um, coming close to red. They are having challenges in servicing their debts vis-a-vis -vis the need to respond to the health crisis currently in their countries. So the green is the moderate risk and the dark green is the low risk. So Africa, if the debts are not managed very well, um, this continent may go red. And once it goes red, um, it shows uh, that the countries will lose, their, will lose their sovereignty because debt um, can result in countries losing their sovereignty. They will not be able to make decisions without the involvement of their creditors. An example is that currently of Argentina. Um, an example is currently of Mozambique, for example, because of the challenge with its debts, it has attracted outsiders who largely would tell it what to do economically and even politically. So debts needs to be managed very well so that you don't invite outsiders to decide what's best for the country. Here we are trying to show that domestic debt as well is also rising. Um, for Sub-Saharan Africa, when you look in 2011 to 2013, um, it wasn't much, but by 2018, you will see that it has gone, uh, domestic debt has also increased if you are to compare to external debt. Uh, this is also a major concern. Um, this slide is showing that African countries, African countries ignoring IMF advice on debt. So they are digging themselves in here. Stop shoveling, you may find yourself trapped again. Yes, we talked of Africa's past debts, but currently a number of African countries are repeating the same mistakes from the past. Um, and this is leading them into new debt crisis. So the IMF is advising, yes. Is it a good advice? I think that's very debatable. Is advising countries to take debts that are sustainable and be transparent about the whole issue of uh, loan contraction and debt management. I think the advice of the IMF, um, not all African countries can ignore it, but we know that developed countries, sometimes they ignore the advice of the IMF. But in terms of developing countries, the IMF have a stronghold on what African countries, not only on debt, but even economic issues, um, as long as they have an IMF program, uh, they are likely to toe the line. So the big question is, the IMF, are African 
governments and countries taking the advice from the IMF in terms of debt management? If so, why is it the debt is rising? The stocks are going up. The indicators are being breached. Uh, so it's very important that that discussion takes place. There are so many impacts. Debt really is a devastating... Um, <clears throat> It's, it really devastates, uh, it is huge impacts on African countries' economies and life in general. So here you find that many African countries therefore now face significant risk of declining economy or growth, uh, deteriorating living conditions uh, with the poor and the vulnerable who need health and education bearing the brand of economic decline. So when a country's economy goes down, I think the risks and the, 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 the conditions really goes down as well. And this really affects the, the poor and the vulnerable sections of our societies. Um, we have seen reduced social spending. Reduced social spending compromises the quality of human capital. We have also seen that this is likely usually accompanied by escalation of taxes, which places a, a, on a higher cost of living burden on the population. Infrastructure spending cuts reduce prospects for industrial development and debt distribution usually implies cutting back on key social sectors. So in other ways, this reflects how governments will respond when it gets into a dis debt distress or debt challenges. When it defaults, when it cannot service its debts, it increases taxes, it cuts on expenditure, social sector expenditures, it stops building roads, hospitals, because all the money that it is getting at the moment is otherwise going, is directed to service the debts. Given the history where we are coming from in Sub-Saharan Africa and also going forward vis-a-vis -vis the development needs that our, our citizens our countries have in their plans. How are they going to finance them if they don't take more debt? There are countries that are already in debt distress. There are countries that are in high risk of debt distress. And uh, Angola is one of that country, or one of those countries. And this is just a debt profile of Angola. We're here. Um, we are trying to bring out some of the facts that Angola is one of the most heavily indebted countries in sub-Saharan Africa and is considered a high risk of plunging into a full-blown debt crisis. Most of the debt comprises external debt, which is very risky, and it exposes the country to interest rates, fluctuation, and exchange rate, uh, exchange, exchange risks. The country is over-reliant on oil revenue, making it vulnerable to international price fluctuations. Um, the lack of transparency, public debt management, uh, public spending on health and education has declined while the expenditure on defense and debt services has increased. Currently, the country is a 77.2 billion in terms of uh, the debt stock, uh, of which 49.3 billion is, is external debt, then 22.9 billion is, uh, is domestic debt. Uh, and total debt savings taking 13.4% of the value of the exports. These are also figures just showing the, the, the debt stock in terms of billions. In 2000, it was very less than a billion, but by 2022, in terms of the projections, it will be close to, close to 78 billion. The same as a percentage of GDP, I think there were periods when the, it was down to less than 20, that is around 2006, but we have seen it increasing uh, very much from 2015 uh, to 2019. And some are going down from 2020 this year and the projection for the next two years is also that shows that it's going down. Angola is the second most indebted uh, country in Southern Africa, after South Africa, of which we know that South Africa is debt in terms of the figures uh, are really big, are huge, 209 billion, um, and largely most of it is uh, commercial and private debt and also domestic debt, uh, but Angola is number two within the, the, the SADC region. 
So public debt to GDP and debt service to debt service to revenue ratios are very high in Angola, uh, reflecting increased deficit financing, uh, lower nominal GDP and current depreciation. These are some of the, the, the reasons that have caused the rise that have caused the rise we have seen in terms of the debt stock in Angola. Um, in 2017, the new president then, Lorenzo, promised to institute sweeping and corruption campaign. Um, but as you are aware that there are challenges in that front, um, but also the debt has been caused, the rise in the debt in the country has also been caused by fluctuating oil prices. We, 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 we as, 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 as exporters of oil, special African countries, they don't control the prices of these. So they are left to the whim of the international commodity markets. So they, goes, they go up and down. But even if they go up and down, what are our countries doing in terms of, um, in terms of uh, mitigating uh, the impacts when such fluctuations do happen? Countries know that prices, commodity prices, they fluctuate, they go up and down. But how do you prepare for the times when, when, when the prices go down? I think that's the most important point going forward that uh, resource rich and resource dependent countries need to plan forward. I mean, there's need for a clear plan in terms of how do we manage the, the revenue that we are getting now when the prices are up vis-a-vis -vis when the prices are, are down. Another case within the region is that of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is already in a debt crisis. Um, it is the areas to the IFIs, especially to the World Bank and the African Development Bank and to a lot of bilateral creditors. Um, the country has difficulties to access fine, fine funding from non-traditional lenders. Uh, so currently it is relying heavily on China, especially the Afrizim Zim Bank. Um, there hasn't been much in terms of PPPs, that is public-private partnerships, uh, because of the economic and the political climate in the country. Um, so the country has, uh, has challenges in terms of the debt. This is just a figure showing uh, the increase in terms of the total debt, but also uh, divided into external and domestic debt. So you see from 2014, domestic debt started to increase. Uh, because the country could not access uh, outside outside sources in terms of the debt. You have Zambia as well. Zambia is uh, in a very difficult position currently in terms of the debt stock, which is estimated or cited to be US 11.2 billion, um, of which 5.6 uh, of that debt belongs to the commercial creditors. And this is the type of debt that is very risky. So you have domestic debt standing as well, close to 5.7 billion. Debt stock of 90% as a uh, debt to GDP ratio of 90%, which is way, way, way ahead or way, way past the threshold stipulated by the IMF. So does that mean that Zambia doesn't listen to IMF advice when it comes to some of these debt indicators or ratios? And it is very important that discussions around those issues also um, be brought to the fore. Like Angola, like Zimbabwe, like Zambia, Mozambique is equally in a bad state in terms of its debt. Where we see that um, um, the debt to GDP is actually deteriorated uh, between 2014 and 2016. In the last years, uh, we've also seen that the, the public debt grew more than four times between 2006 and 2015, an average annual growth rate of 15%, of which is, uh, uh, it's a big issue. But mainly, we have also seen the, the so-called hidden debts in Mozambique, where, where government officials uh, borrowed uh, externally without the knowledge of the responsible stakeholders within the country. We are also seeing poor investments in terms of 
where the debt resources are being invested. I think they are in sectors that uh, will not yield much. Um, we have also seen a very uh, large FDI in terms of uh, uh, the ex extractive sector, the oil and gas sector. A lot of companies have come into Mozambique to to invest in that sector. But this is a sector with the potential to take the country out of poverty and also to enable the country to repay its debts. But it's all about how it's managed uh, going forward. So that's the profile that shows that by 2018, uh, Mozambique had close to 14.2 uh, 14 14 billion in terms of the debt by 2018 which is a, a, a huge, a huge, um, huge amount. But uh, another important aspect of this whole sovereign debt issues is, in the first place, why do our countries borrow? Are our domestic resources not enough to propel our own development or to finance our own development? So basically here, there are four reasons why governments borrow. One is structural purposes to finance development expenditure, such as construction of roads. Secondly, political purposes to increase the expenditure before an election. As such funds are normally used for unproductive people just to please the electorate prior to the elections. Um, should election be funded through borrowing or through debt? I think that's the big debate here. The, the other reason is market development purposes to create some financial instrument that facilitate both primary and secondary trading on financial markets. Um, to stimulate the economy in downturn, if you have an economy that is uh, down and going down, I think you can bring in new resources, you can borrow money, inject it in the economy, uh, and the economy kickstarts. Debt increases economic growth when it is generally kept within sustainable levels. Uh, empirical evidence puts the threshold at below 90% for advanced economies and 60% for emerging and developing market economies. So anything above 60% in most of our countries uh, is considered to be unsustainable and it will not uh, help us in terms of resuscitating the economy. We have a scenario of late where African countries have gone on to borrow from the sovereign debt, uh, what they call sovereign bonds, that is borrowing from the international capital markets, where we have Ghana was the first country, and by 2019, we had close to 92 billion of outstanding African sovereign euro bonds, and most of them, they are in US dollars, and um, this is a very risky date. So countries need to be very careful when it comes to borrowing from the international capital markets. An area of discussion that economic activists need to look at the funds that governments are raising from the international capital markets. Angola is one of those countries. Zimbabwe is, I mean, Mozambique is one of those. Namibia, quite a number of countries from the region have gone on to the international capital markets to raise uh, sovereign bonds. But the most important is to, what are those funds utilized for currently? Are they bringing economic development? What are the processes being followed to ensure that they follow the national laws and regulation pertaining to debt management? I think these are very important uh, questions we need to subject some of these borrowings we see today vis-a-vis -vis the risks associated with um, sovereign bonds. Some of the factors affecting African countries to cope with sustainable public debt, <clears throat> I think this has become a song. In each and every country, you hear misuse and mismanagement of resources. We see a lot of, due, due to weak public institutions, we hear poor governance and low implementation capacity. I think these are some of the, uh, the reasons which makes it very difficult for African countries to cope with, um, with sustainable public debt. Um, again, as they fail to manage their debts, a number of countries have gone to do what they call debt restructuring, 
which is a process used to order the term the key terms of sovereign debt contracts through negotiation between debtors and creditors so this is one of the the, the option that is available to our countries sometimes when they get into trouble with managing their debt they go back to the creditor and ask for debt restructuring so some of these slides they they have the facts and points uh with regard to to how governments can can restructure their debts so the big question might be what are the consequences of sovereign debt restructuring what does that tell you in terms of the capacity of any given country to go to its credit and ask to restructure its debts i think it does tell a story and it's very important that um, countries yes it's important that they restructure the debts but it's also important that they re, they, they, they they look unto themselves in terms of what is causing us to be unable to save our debts on time and in full regardless of the other external factors because some of the external factors might be economic shocks globally might be some pandemic for example covid-19 or it might be internal factors of which internal factors a lot of our countries have control over what is it that governments in especially in Africa can do to mitigate uh, debt vulnerabilities i think here have quite a number of points where we have they need to mobilize domestic resources and improve expenditure quality yes they need their debt management strategy should be anchored on credible macroeconomic frameworks they need to strengthen public debt transparency they need to diversify production of export bases and strengthen public institution uh, they need to interrogate the analysis of natural resource assets in debt management framework if you are angola and you are rich in oil it is very important that you you have that link between debt and natural resources or extractive industry your natural resource assets can they offset your debt obligations or the proceeds from the natural resources can they save the debts i think this is something that needs to be angered in broad macroeconomic frameworks uh, going forward as a way of mitigating some of the resolution and some of the challenges um as i said has to do with private creditors because they are risk the china factor is very important one going forward um and it's also important that countries don't attract uh, non-debt creating flows uh, so that they avoid um, crowding the private sector uh, but maybe lastly afroda at some point developed the borrowing charter which is basically a set of principles and guidelines uh, that african countries can follow in terms of how they can borrow manage debt and do their debt restructuring if necessary so we have a borrowing charter that is also in in, in portuguese basically it, it hinges on the following broad principles and guidelines we have an agency transparency and accountability issues project financing issues uh, legal frameworks disclosure and publications adequate management and monitoring i think in our view these are very important principles uh, and guidelines of any uh, responsible borrowing um, process they are institutions responsible and those institutions should be guided very well the fact that if you are financing project through debt and a good analysis of project financing that is the cost vis-a-vis -vis the benefits cost and benefit analysis becomes very key any borrowing should be angered on legal framework what are those legal frameworks in place as we go forward um publication of debt information is very key for anyone for the creditors for the lenders for the citizens i think information on debt should be published and disclosed and adequate management and monitoring i think this is very key with the relationship to all the projects that are financed through 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 debt so in conclusion let me say that um a deep analysis of key risks to, to debt sustainability is critical for countries to cope with new risks and challenges emanating from new borrowing opportunities already our countries have borrowed as we have said due to the increase in the in the in the in the, in the levels so a deep analysis of some of the risks is very key going forward and 
how do you mitigate against those risks? I think as we implement whether they might be extractive projects, I think there is that important that we link it to debts because we have seen countries uh, mortgaging natural resources, uh, getting loans, for example, from China and uh, promising the Chinese that they will pay through oil, they will pay through diamonds and any other natural resources available. I think without the proper analysis of our natural resources, um, this offsetting of debts with natural resource concession doesn't work. The implication of non-traditional debt instrument tied to commodities on debt sustainability needs to be discussed and analyzed properly. The, resource, the natural resource sector is very opaque. There is demand for transparency and accountability in that sector going forward. Let me stop here and uh, uh, I look forward to the to the webinar on the 29th of, uh, of September where we can discuss in detail um, some of the issues I've raised. I have skipped a lot of stuff because of time constraint, but I hope that you have enough time before the Zoom webinar to go through some of this slide, raise your issues, read some of the, um, the, the, the books or the further reading sources I, I gave you so that uh, come the 29th of September, we have a robust discussion and also a discussion that is not only about questioning, but also giving um, <coughs> points and discussions to the issues of debt in our countries. And Angola, as I said, is one of those countries that is really in debt difficulties. And as citizens of Angola, I think it's very important that we equip ourselves with the, with the knowledge uh, and expertise uh, so that we advise governments and demand accountability and transparency when it comes to sovereign debt issues. Thank you very much. <music>